Hi, my name is Kim and I am the Efficiency Coordinator with the Ecology Action Center. And I want to acknowledge that I'm in Chibuktuk and the Ecology Action Center um, is in Chibuktuk and that we're in Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq Maliseet peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognize Mi'kmaq title and establish the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. And we wanna honor um, that we are able to do the good work that we're doing today because of that care and sharing of the land. So, Thank you for that. Um, and I don't see everyone here, but I think we'll just, we'll, we'll get going. So welcome to the Better Building series. Um, this is an ongoing series that the Ecology Action Center does in partnership with Efficiency Nova Scotia. And it's an opportunity to showcase uh, innovations that are happening that help to build towards energy efficiency in lots of different ways. And though we've tended to to focus on issues that have to do with building. This is maybe a new topic for us in looking at electric vehicle charging stations, but I feel like it's a really important topic for um, building better buildings that will help get us um, into a post-carbon economy. And I'm really grateful to have George Solomon who uh, works with Efficiency Nova Scotia um, and is one of the business development Mint, um, officers uh, with Efficiency Nova Scotia, who's going to do a presentation um, for us today on the multi-unit residential building um, project um, that they're engaged with. And then after he does his presentation, our uh, electric vehicle coordinator um, on our energy team at the EAC, um, Thomas, will just um, speak about some of the work that he's doing and we're doing at the Ecology Action Center on this topic, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A. Um, so if you have questions, if you're on Facebook, you can type them into the chat there. Um, our colleague Claire's behind the scenes. She's helping take care of all the technical pieces. So if there's something that you can't hear or something goes wrong, you can also um, put that in the chat and, and she can help us take care of it. Um, so questions can go, go there. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can put questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, but I'm very, very grateful that on a beautiful, beautiful, sunny uh, late spring evening, all of you are here. Um, and George, that you've uh, uh, chosen to come and spend some time with us. So I'm gonna pass it over to you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, having me here uh, to speak tonight. It's an absolute pleasure. So I'll go ahead and um, share my screen. Hopefully this will go completely seamlessly. How's that? Is that coming up on screen? Can you see it, Thomas? I can't see it. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Now I can see it. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, that's full screen now, is it? Good to go? Okay, all right. <laughs> that works. We're good. <laughs> thank you very much. Starting timer now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, like I said, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to come and speak to you. My name is George Solomon, Business Development Manager at Efficiency One. Um, I have a number of verticals that I oversee, and one of those is electric vehicles. And uh, it's a pleasure to come and speak to you tonight about electric vehicles with respect to multi-unit residential buildings, or MERBs, as they are known by an acronym. So, some discussion points um, that I'm going to cover in this um, in this presentation. I'm going to give you a quick introduction of myself and what um, what I and others have been doing. Um, in the last couple of years with respect to EVs. I'm going to give some evidence um, for EV adoption growth. I'm going to answer the question, why focus on MERVs? 
uh, and then I'm going to speak to the MERV challenges that underpin some of those questions, uh, the, the, you know, the reasoning behind MERVs. And then uh, the road ahead, I'll speak to a um, exciting program that, um, that we've got in development. So quick introduction of myself, I have an electrical engineering and business background. Uh, so that kind of, that, um, you know, it, it bodes well for EVs, which is good. Um, around 2020, I began assisting the Trillium building uh, downtown. They were looking to get some EV chargers um, installed there and they wanted to know how to do it and how, you know, what was possible, what wasn't possible, what were the problems involved and how to get past the hurdles and get things done. And the work, believe it or not, is ongoing. And that's, um, you know, continuing to inform uh, the, the work that I'm doing now. Then about the same time, we had an EV roundtable with Darren Fisher, the, um, uh, our uh, Federal Department MP. Um, and uh, that had um, College Action Centre, we had Clean, we had NSPI, we had Krista from um, DNRR, um, we had HRM and Efficiency. So we had a good group of people and um, we started discussing EV issues and then kind of went, um, went about getting things done uh, in our own, in our own uh, backyards. And then over that time, what we've kind of done is refined into MERVs as being a focus group. And it's because of some things that I'll you know, mention later in this presentation, but as to why we're focusing on MERVs, but that's kind of been the direction uh, for the last couple of years that has been refining towards really solving the problem of electric vehicle charging in MERVs. Uh, and then 2022, we started a um, MERB ESV, EVSC development group. And uh, that's largely the same group, um, same people involved from the round table and plus, one, uh, plus and minus one or two people, which is, um, which is great. And again, it's um, to enhance that focus on MERBs and develop things further because it really, really needs it. And then uh, we have a successful program uh, for funding for um, in about April this year, um, which I'll speak to. Uh, later in the presentation. So uh, here's some evidence of EV adoption growth. Um, I'll start now. I don't want to get too much into this, but I do think it's imp important. You know, if we're going to speak to, if we're going to say that you know, electric vehicle charging and moves is important, then we need to say why it's important. You know, it's it's hard to do and it's challenging, but you know, if if no one's demanding it, then it's really you know, it's not really a big deal. But the problem is that, is that it is a big deal, and it's because there is growing um, there is growing demand um, and adoption of electric vehicles in Nova Scotia and throughout Canada and in North America. And this is a basic ownership cost, and it really just shows, you know, a, a standard gasoline sedan um, and a standard Tesla Model 3, uh, you know, taxes in, on-road delivered. And you can see there that the OPEX of a gasoline car is considerably higher to a tune of about a factor of four than the electric vehicle. And so that convergence point at about seven and a half years that cost about the same. Um, and that was when gas was $1.70 a litre and now we're over $2 a litre. And so it's probably more like six to six and a half years and it just keeps trekking left to the point where enough people, you know, every, every inch that it moves left, more and more people, um, you know, make the business case to go EV versus gasoline. Some other um, considerations. Off-peak kilowatt hours in Nova Scotia and many other provinces are half price, roughly. They're about nine cents a kilowatt hour um, between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. during the week, 16 cents otherwise. Uh, and so, you know, many people, 80% um, uh, of people want to do charging at home, according to the USDOE. And so uh, many people do that when they're asleep and when it's past 11 p.m. and so it's half price. So that's another really, you know, again, you know, the already low cost of, you know, e electric charging is now half price if you've got time of day. Volume production is stepping up and prices are coming down. A lot of R&D has been amortized, it's been paid off. And, um, production volumes are, are, um, are, are rising despite obviously, you know, high inflation and, and, and strangled supply chains. Um, but, you know, those, those factors, affect all markets equally. And so, you know, the volume is still picking up and, uh, you know, production of EVs is still picking up. So that's, that is going to put upward pressure on supply, which is great to meet the demand. And um, we have also have federal and provincial car sales targets. Um, and, you know, those are growing as well. And they're currently set federally uh, at 60% by 2030. So what that means is the federal government wants um, annual sales 
of vehicles uh, in each province to be 60%. Um, and that's, um, it sounds like a big number and it is a big number. It is a very big number, especially considering we've only got about eight years to get there. So, uh, but then you say, well, you know, is that even just, is that just, you know, campaigning, right? Just, you know, get, you know getting, getting in the votes. But I actually took some S&P data on growth rate of um, ratio of electric vehicles to regular vehicles. And I projected it out to 2030 and um, we're tracking to get, we'd at that right now, the growth rate that we're at, we're getting 54% by 2030. So, you know, that just needs to uh, step up a little bit and we'll be in line with that. So it is actually heading that way. So again, that's pretty impressive. And then finally, all in V, this, uh, this is Jeremy Burden and then uh, one or two of his associates um, started all EV, which is a used EV dealership a couple of years ago, and they were acquired by Steel. Steel didn't shut them down, they brought them in house, and you know they added them to their um, to their forward plan for electric vehicles. And that's a big signal because you know you don't get into business and stay in business by you know being average. You, you, you get into business to stay in business by being good and making good decisions and being well informed. Uh, and and so you know they're taking this used EV um, dealership and they've added it to their, their offering um, beside the new EV dealership. Now they've pretty much got, you know, a really strong offering regardless of how you want to enter the EV market. And that's, I think, a fantastic thing for, when you, for, for everyone for Nova Scotia. And then here's a, um, an anecdotal piece from a colleague of mine who has an SUV, a battery, a uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Um, he just sent me this and said, I thought you might want to know about this. This was very recently, but this is, um, you know, a Nova Scotia example, 197 Ks, um, 156 of those were electric at 16 cents a kilowatt hour or $8.32. 41 were gas at about the same price um, at $2.10 a litre premium, though it'd be, but still, still not too far off what you get regular. Um, so it's cost him $16.74 and he saved $24.44, you know, instead of doing it completely gas. So when you extrapolate that over roughly 20,000 Ks a year in a car, it's two and a half grand. So, you know, you do that for four years and, and now you've got $10,000. So everyone talks about the capital cost of electric vehicles being high. Well, you know, that, that operating expenditure is significantly lower. And I think this, the nice thing about this is, is that uh, this is a Nova Scotia car that's registered in Nova Scotia. It's using Nova Scotia gas and it's using Nova Scotia electrons from Nova Scotia power. So, you know, it's about as accurate as, about as, you know, credible as you can get for what you can use as a gauge. Um, but again, it's showing that that business case for EVs is very strong. So then, okay, so, you know, we've established that the growth of EVs is going to happen and it's going to happen exponentially. So now the question is why multi-unit residential buildings? Why do we focus on those? Um, and the first piece is, I might just, it's not on the slide here, but I did mention that there was a new SDOE study that was done um, a year or so ago um, with ChargePoint actually, where they found that 80% um, of EV owners want to do their charging at home. And so there's that there's a really strong need for people to have control over how they use their electric vehicles. And, and they get that through being able to charge at home. Like I can guarantee that I have fuel for my vehicle or energy for my vehicle if I, you know, if I do it at home. So what that means is when you look at a motor unit residential, that's the residential piece, right? It's not just a commercial building, it's actually a commercial building full of residential units. Uh, and then 20% of Nova Scotia households are MERV units. It's, um, it's a staggering amount, it's about 80,000 MERV units in Nova Scotia and about 400,000 households in total. And of those, 20% are condos and about 80% are apartments. So 20%, that's a good thing because the apartments are, are appear right now to be easier not to crack from the condos, um, but it's still a challenge nonetheless. Um, MERVs have roughly, roughly 10% spare electrical capacity. And that's, I use that term very, very loosely, roughly. Um, you do need a, a capacity study um, to confirm, but you know, the MERVs that exist, they are, uh, they're, they're all retrofit projects for this. And so, you know, they were all designed under regular um, or, you know, usual, business as usual electrical loads. And so to go and add the electric vehicle demand to the, all of those is, is you know, it's, you can't just switch them all on because it's pretty much doubling the, the demand of the, of the building um, in some respects. 
Um, so you need a capacity study, and it, you know that's a you need you need that to happen. Otherwise, you know you can plunge the building into darkness, and that's not a good thing. And then uh, by mid twenty twenty eight, based on my numbers before, I projected that um, MERB EVSE demand will reach ten percent. So that's based on those numbers. Um, the demand um, reaching ten percent. If we put that equally across, um, you know, uh, MERB occupants, then that number will happen about twenty twenty eight. And so, you know, what that means is that's five to six years to get, you know, eight thousand charges installed in buildings across Nova Scotia. Um, and it sounds like a lot of time, but it really, it's not a lot of time, especially with what we're experiencing with supply constraints and capacity constraints, you know, with um, consultants and contractors and, and trying to get things through Nova Scotia Power. They've got a lot of demand for their services. The transformers on a good, at a, at a good time, you know, service transformers, are six months, um, usually 12. And <laughs> now I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect anything sooner than 24. And so you can see when the demand really picks up that the time um, just really extends out. And again, this is why moves are the most important to really, really fix because that residential, like residential aspect and because there's so many things that we have to do to get them moving in the right direction. So what are the challenges? Like I said, uh, condo boards are proving to be troublesome for EVSE progress, right? Um, the Trillium building recently finally got around to voting on installing something like seven EV charges to start with. And 33% <laughs> voted for installing them, 2.8% voted against, and the rest didn't vote. Um, and so here's me pulling my hair out the other end of the line. But uh, you know, that's you know, 64% of the building didn't vote, but based on the numbers that we had, if it was scaled up, we would have got two thirds with a two thirds majority needed to, to vote it in um, and so you know right now that means that it's not voted for and so it's not it's not at this stage not going ahead um, and so you know we need to think about how we address that what do we what do we do there and we've got a number of things that we can do we can get an awareness campaign you know uh, we can quell people's fears we can speak to why it's a really really much better financial uh, planning decision to encourage the install of these things now we can also look at uh, legislation to, to you know, look at ways that we might be able to relieve uh, condo boards of the duty of voting on EV charges and just say, listen, you don't need to vote on that because it's just everyone's in the same boat and it just goes ahead. Um, and that, that could be one, one, one approach I think is probably going to be needed. Um, but you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, the inevitable MERV electrical supply upgrades. So what's so you know you'll need to get that 10% in in the next five years minimum. But then, you know, there's the rest, there's the other 90%. And, um, you know, there's going to come a time when the line, the queue gets very long and we're going to need, and, and you know, it's not just Nova Scotia, it's, it's you know, <laughs> the whole of Canada is going to need contractors and consultants and funding to get these things moving. And it's, and you know, that, that demand is really going to extend times. And so, you know, trying to meet that demand of 60% by 2030 is going to be that much more challenging, but it's, it's going to be because, it's going to be because, it's going to be because, sorry, um, you know, we don't get moving early enough. And like I said, uh, I think I mentioned this before, NSPI needs to plan transformer upgrades. They pretty much, they're going to need some much bigger transformers and they, they don't, um, and they might have to upgrade uh, sub mains as well, because, you know, you're trying to poke, same, you know, twice the electrons down in the same, the same cable and, and a lot of them aren't sized you know you don't you don't gold plate um your electrical design because it's expensive uh and so you know there's a lot of upgrading that needs to happen in order to make that stuff happen and then um new construction verbs need to future proof um their builds so you know you need to put in a, a, extra space in your electrical room um so that you can put your, you know the extra boards so you need to design that with the architect. The electrical designer needs to tell NSBI they need double the load or whatever, whatever they, you know, they decide they need. Uh, they need to put in conduit so that the submain can exist. And if they were smart, they'd probably just put the submain in right now uh, so they don't have to retrench because that's expensive. And so, you know, new construction, you know, anyone who's building a new MERB right now would, you know, would, would be very well, um, would, you know, be, it would be a very good decision to uh, to future proof themselves for EV charges right now in their building. 
So what does the road ahead look like? Um, we were lucky enough to have the good folks at um, the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables. It's uh, Chris Phillips, who um, does some fantastic work. And we've managed to get um, a million dollars over two to three years. We're currently designing this program at the moment, excuse me, and we are forecasting 220 charger installs in that time and retrofit and new construction. Uh, more um, retrofit than new construction, I think about 165-ish in retrofit and the balance in new construction, and 12 capacity studies in, in the retrofit. And uh, we're planning to do that over the next two to three years. We're hoping to run, very quickly run out of money. Um, that's the hope. <laughs> um, but we'll see how we go. Uh, so what does that look like? We, um, for the new construction part of the relay program, uh, we have $500 purchase and install um, incentive. And um, it'll be three charges per building plus one per 20 units. And it's so that we're trying to balance spreading, um, you know, allowing as many people as possible to access the rebate, but also making it, you know, attractive. So if you've got a hundred unit building, you know, three charges might not be quite attractive enough to move on, but, um, you know, that extra one per 20 units is another five. So a hundred unit building would have eight. And that, that makes sense. It's, it's around about that 10% um, mark. And then for the retrofit, it's a two and a half thousand dollar purchase and install. And we know this from, again, from experience with the Trillium, it's, is um, you know you really have to know what you're working with. You have to find common boards and supplies with capacity, and then you have to sometimes put in transformers and extra boards and pony boards and that kind of stuff, and then run reticulation out to the the um, parking spaces, and it's, it's costly. It's costly with, um, in comparison to new construction, and so we want to really make sure that people are incentivized to do that. And then we're going to do again three per building and one per twenty units, so the same scaling. Um, but there's also four thousand dollars there for a capacity study, and that's to get a uh, that's to get uh, a consultant to have a look at to either log the building or uh, to uh, to log the building or to look at the uh, interval data from Nova Scotia Power and do a demand analysis on the main supply of the building and and look at where those tap offs can happen and where we can get supply from. And then finally, um, you know, what is this program about? And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's about overcoming inertia. We're really, there's some movement right now. I think Killen's doing some movement with um, some of their buildings, their apartment buildings, but for the most part, it's, it's, we're not moving very much and we need to move a lot. And so the first part of that is really overcoming that, that inertia so that we can point to, well, we're doing it here and we're doing it here and we're doing it there and they're doing it. These are doing, this is what these guys found. And all of a sudden it's normalized that some people are doing it and you can move on to the next stage. But um, we really, really need to get that inertia. We need to advance our understanding and knowledge, right? So all of our projections need to be refined. We need to get this, you know, really good data because you can build better and more credible business cases to convince people to move forward when you have better understanding and knowledge. So that's a, that's a continuous improvement piece. And then transitioning to and accelerating for building solutions, as I said. So, you know, start off eight to 10%, but you've still got that 90%. And, um, you know, EVs are, um, are gonna turn up very, you know, very quickly. And, and um, those buildings are gonna need to have a solution to be able to offer EVs in every parking spot. And, you know, it's, it's important because, you know, there's also, there's, there is an aspect there that if you've got a building and, and people are looking for accommodations and they're making decisions on whether they buy a single family home or they go into, you know, some other type of accommodation or a condo or an apartment, but, you know, you can't consider a condo because you can't get an electric vehicle charger. Um, you know, it's not just, oh, the, you know, the closet's a little small or the dishwasher's not quite big enough. It's, you know, you can't actually operate your transport the way you want to because of this, because of this living style. And so, you know, what does that do? Well, by natural attrition, it will take people out of the market, which just lowers the, the cost of the, the, um, the, you know, the, the appraisal value of that building. So people's assets, Asset values are, are, you know, are in jeopardy as well, and that needs to be, that message needs to be clearly, um, you know, put to people that it's like, this is, um, you know, we need to move as quickly as we can now, so we don't get this log jam and problems with this stuff in the stuff in the future. But we're hoping that this um, that our program is really going to kickstart that, 
and that um, we can work together to really move things forward. And um, and I think at this point, um, I'd like to, yeah, open the floor to some questions if anyone has any. I'll start off. I have a question. So, and this, I mean, this is great. And um, you made so many points I hadn't thought of, like even just the last one, like around condos and, you know, multi-unit residential, like if they don't do this, that, that would have long-term implications in terms of the resale value of those units, et cetera. So I like, hadn't thought of that as a great argument to be in, doing the install now. Um, I have a question in terms of like, how is the funding coming from other levels of government as well to support initiatives like this? Um, do you foresee, like I know that there's a strategy from the Nova Scotia government and from the feds, but do you see coming down soon a lot more money to support even more programs like the one that you're running? Yes, yes, yeah, so there is a Z the program through the program and um, it's, it would, you know, it's um, it's for at least twenty um, charger heads, um, and there's um, it's quite a it's a it's it's more of a, um, a commitment in terms of managing that money and reporting on that on on you know the installs and the and the performance of those things. There's quite a long process involved, um, but um, there's, there's there are efforts you know, in play to try and streamline that and, and find different ways to deliver that money. But it has, we have had some Ziva um, applications that have been great and it, there've been charges that have been installed. Um, and, um, but it is that minimum size of 20 heads. And so it's sort of these, these two programs off, you know, kind of operate um, in parallel to each other really. Um, the, you know, the Ziva could be used for the, for the wider, the bigger install and this could be used to get the ball rolling um, without as much, without as much effort. So, you know, on the reporting side and the, and the diligence side of things. Um, so, you know, that's a, and that's a great program. And we really hope that that keeps getting funded. And it looks like um, that it will keep getting funded um, because it's a, it's a great program. And it includes, it also includes, so it has level two charges as one of its, um, uh, as one of its fields, but has three, I believe, three level one uh, categories, which are the, the fast charges. And so, you know, we're really hoping to see some development in that, in that aspect too, so that you know that interprovincial um, travel can really start to take take hold as well. Thank you for that. I think Thomas, did you want to speak next and kind of like respond a little bit to this and how it intersects with some of the work that you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Before I get into it, uh, I'm just sort of curious. From your perspective, is there any need for uh, for fast chargers in the context of multi-unit residential buildings, or is it is it really just the, the level two chargers? Uh, I can't. I wouldn't be involved to say no. Um, I think you know there probably could be applications where it could be useful. I think with MERBs, you know most. Of the, well, you know what? A lot of some some MIBs have mixed use functionality, so they have commercial buildings. The Trillium is no different; it has commercial buildings at its base, right? And so, you know, those fast charges could be really useful there. And you know, that is a that is a design consideration. If you're going to go to to the to the to the extent of of you know um, upgrading the capacity of your electrical supply, then you should think about, well, is it worth having fast charges? Um, you know, do will those commercial build, will the attractiveness or competitiveness of those businesses be um, enhanced by having those services available, in which case you'd be able to raise the rent on those spaces. So yeah, that is, I, I would say that there are, there are um, probably commercial demand for that kind of a charger. Um, I have a feeling that the level two is probably enough for the residential side, and that I, I, I would say most most of them will charge. You know, you get about 50, about fifty kilometers is the average that you charge that you drive in a car every day. This is what they work out about fifty kilometers. This is according to manu charging manufacturers. And so, when you've got about four to five hundred k's in a charge, then you know you only need a fraction of your battery charged overnight. And so, that's quite doable. You know, eleven km to seven am. So, there's not that fast charge requirement, but there is. 
a lot more needed than just the you know the extension cord out of the, <laughs> the ten amp plug you know so um, so yeah I would say that there are there is there is a need for level one charges but probably in a commercial aspect. Thanks for that. Yeah, uh, part of the reason I ask is because I uh, I get that question occasionally. So it's it's. Yeah, I mean, once, once you start thinking about, it, I'm just thinking also visitors, like the visitor spaces, right? You know, they might want to they might want to put charge for 30 minutes and you know get half a charge kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, but certainly harder to deploy uh, the fast chargers. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Some big some big cables involved. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, so I can speak a little bit to uh, <clears throat> to some of the uh, the work that we've done in, uh, on the electric vehicle file at the EAC, uh, and mainly it's had to do with increasing the supply of EVs in Nova Scotia. Uh, and I, I wrote a little bit about this uh, in the, the Chronicle Herald uh, this weekend, um, but. You know, uh, essentially, uh, what we have in, in Nova Scotia right now, and, and what we have had for some time, is a is a supply problem. Um, and so, a lot of our work thus far has been aimed at trying to uh, get something here called a supply side mandate, uh, which would essentially require a certain number of um, vehicles sold, new vehicles sold, uh, to be electric uh, by X date. Uh, and so we're very happy about um, the policy that was mentioned, the, the federal government targets um, of 60% um, of new vehicle sales to be electric by uh, 2030. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously you have to sort of mention that uh, no one will be required to buy an electric vehicle as a result. It will, cert it will simply ensure that the electric vehicles are, are in supply. Uh, and so that people don't have to wait um, that people don't have to experience long wait times like they're experiencing uh, right now. And that if they, they are interested in purchasing an electric vehicle, they can't. Um, I think that uh, a lot of my you know, takeaways based on what you said uh, just has to do with you know, how essential it is to try and uh, get prepared now um, for electric vehicle deployment. Uh, you mentioned future demand and from our perspective, the, the first thing that we have to do is, is make sure that the supply is here. Um, because what we're seeing, I think is, <laughs> and this you know, has something to do with the increased price of gas, um, uh, a greater demand for electric vehicles, particularly in the last uh, couple of months. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, we, we've tried to play a pretty significant role in uh, getting, first getting a provincial ZEV mandate passed here to ensure that we have enough supply. Uh, and, and now, thankfully, we have a, a federal one. Um, but while we're doing that work and while we're ensuring that there's enough uh, electric vehicles available in the province, it's essential to make sure that, uh, yeah, we're ready from a jurisdictional perspective in, in terms of charging. And you mentioned that, you know, most charging is gonna take place at home um, or plug in EV chargers, uh, yeah, 80%. Um, so if we can get that charging um, to be available through multiple multi-unit residential buildings and, and ideally to occur off peak uh, where people can achieve the highest savings, uh, then that's something that we need to start doing now. Uh, and, and I think that uh, sometimes when you're involved in this work, uh, you see instances in which uh, we're putting the cart a little bit before the horse um, in terms of not having enough uh, EV charging available. Uh, one example I'm thinking of in particular is uh, around electric school buses uh, in, in talking to folks who work in PEI. Uh, and what they've told us is, if, you know, they had a period in which they, they bought those electric school buses and they didn't have the charging infrastructure in place. And so those buses sort of just sit around a lot and you end up getting caught flat footed. So all that to say that <laughs> let's not get caught flat-footed, uh, ideally, let's let's start doing that work now in order to sure, ensure that those chargers are available. Um, because, you know, I think, and, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit as well, George, but um, it's something that we hear pretty frequently um, in surveys is that uh, range anxiety, uh, having to do with charging, having to do with um, the worry that you're not gonna be able to find a charger when you need one when you're driving an EV. 
uh, you know, that this is something that still still holds people back. It, it, you know, it's almost a sort of a confidence factor. Um, and so, yeah, all this to say that I'm, I'm incredibly pleased that, you know, this is a program that, that now exists because as we're seeing as well in, in Halifax and around Nova Scotia, an incredible amount of uh, new builds going up, uh, incredible amount of charging infrastructure occurring. Um, and we really need to be thinking about this in a forward thinking way, in a holistic way of how do we get enough electric vehicle supply into the province, but then how do we prepare for a scenario in which we have uh, wide scale electric vehicle deployment uh, in this province. So all the pieces matter. Uh, and in particular, this piece uh, of MERV charging is, is, you know, just absolutely essential. So uh, very happy to hear that this work is going ahead. Uh, I, I guess my question to you is, um, do you feel like, do you feel like this is the most important piece in terms of reducing range anxiety? Um, I am, um, you know, I think it would help with range anxiety, but I, I don't know, I, I think it's more, it's more critical than that. Uh, it's almost more like you can't actually own an EV if you don't have access to a charger, because you can't really operate them. I mean, you can get the, the, the extension cord out of the wall, but it's, it's not enough to operate the EV as you would have, have, as you want to operate it. But you just won't get out of the asset what you want, what you need out for your transportation. And so, um, it sort of almost comes before range anxiety. It's like, I just can't own an EV if I'm in a condo or an apartment right now. Um, but I uh, but I do, you know, I do think, I do strongly think that residential piece um, is, I think if you were to have an electric vehicle and have other options somewhat available that you could make it work if you really wanted to make it work, then uh, having your own EV charger in, you know, your parking space would certainly help with range anxiety because you wouldn't have to manage it as much. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. In terms of it being the most important piece, I feel like it's it's almost like um, you've got to kind of gradually bring all the pieces up equally at the same time and grow organically, so to speak, but as you know, but with plenty of fertilizer, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, you know, um, it's kind of like if we get an influx of EVs, then you need to charge them. But if we get an, you know, an influx of EV charges, then we need EVs to plug in, plug them into. Um, and you need both of those pieces in order to really, you know, move into the future. I think it's, I think the inertia piece that I was speaking to is, it's, um, it's almost like a technology cycle, like an innovation cycle. You know, you always get, you have that curve that, um, I can describe the curve, but it's kind of an exponential curve that kind of rolls off at the end and you've got, your, you know, your very early adopters, the people that really love new things and technology, and you've got, you know, your, you know, your sort of trendsetters and people that sort of like to take it early. Then you've got early adopters and then late adopters and laggards kind of thing. And, the, and you know, with the new, new technology, you need to really keep that chasm to the, to the major audience, um, and then it just becomes normal. And then, you, and then there's new innovation that comes along and goes through the same thing. And it's similar with, I think, with this is that, you know, we need to get those first strikers, those first people there taking it and getting getting that ball rolling, getting some ball rolling so that the early adopters can start to, you know, adopt early. Um, so that so that actual innovation process can happen. And it's it's quite similar. And so we could we could almost learn by osmosis, you know, how do you speed that process up? Maybe we could learn some things to to speed the adoption of EV charges up as well. It's such a like like getting the timing like the it's like once the ball gets rolling i think everyone knows it's going to go really fast but it's the initial thrust to kind of get it rolling that seems to be the, the hard and challenging part right yeah it is. the thing is though is like it, it will it's got I, I have a i have a strong spidey sense feeling that it's going to happen a lot quicker than people expect and mm -hmm. then and then all of a sudden, you know, within a very short space of time, people are going to be calling up contractors and consultants mm -hmm. and no special power and the demand will just go through the roof and then everyone will be waiting for two years, yeah. three years. Yeah. yeah, and it won't be planned as well as it could be, right? If yeah. that's the case, yeah. 
Yeah, so getting it getting it done now and getting you know getting as much as you can done now i think is mm -hmm. you know, really especially if we really want to be serious about meeting our 2030 goals and our 2050 goals we need to get the stuff yeah. moving and and you know it's not like it's not like any of these things are insurmountable we just we just need coordination and we mm -hmm. need we need accurate and strong messaging that that you know presents the the true you know the true business case to people so that they can make good informed decisions and you know it's, it's likely that they'll be for the, you know, because it's, the stuff isn't just going away. Electric cars aren't going anywhere. Um, well, they are, <laughs> but, but you know, they're going, it's going to happen. Like, you know, like gas cars are eventually not going to, eventually they're not going to be around. You know, it's going to be electric or, might, or some other type of propulsion. And so, you know, um, doing that as early as possible, I think is, is good for meeting our, meeting our goals because it's um, super important. Yeah, it, it, it seems to me that there's certain bottlenecks uh, and definitely the supply issue is one of them. Um, and, and definitely the, the, you know, the fact that home chargers aren't necessarily as common as they should be uh, is another. So when you have these sort of bottlenecks and, and people say, well, there's not enough demand in the province, not enough people are driving EVs. Well, you know, it's hard to get behind the wheel uh, when, you know, there's really, really long wait times, hard to find an EV. Uh, and you're worried about the charging factor. Uh, but I, th I think you're right, George. Um, you know, w once we start to really address those bottlenecks and they, they need to be addressed through policy, um, because, you know, that's where you sort of, that's where you run into problems where, where you're saying we don't have enough demand for this, uh, but we can't, we can't get enough demand until these problems are solved. Uh, so <laughs> ideally that's where the role of policy comes in. And I think that once we start to really address some of those problems and it is gonna, pick up pace and I, I think I'm seeing, you know, this is just anecdotal, but uh, I find that I'm, you know, seeing more and more electric vehicles uh, on the road every day. Uh, when I started uh, this position in, you know, in November of last year, I was told that there's about, you know, 600 in total on, on the roads in Nova Scotia. And, you know, I, I feel like just based on the, the ones that I'm seeing around, that uh, can't possibly be true at this point. Um, but I, I think it's kind of, uh, it's, you know, it's a snowball effect in terms of adoption. So um, I'm, I'm interested in the, in the supply piece because this thing like, um, what have you, what have you found to be the main factor with the supply? Is it that, because I'm thinking what might cause that, and is it because say dealers can't get supply or it's expensive to store the cars because people aren't buying them or what are, what are the, what are the pain points there? What are the? Isn't it partly pain? a supply chain issue? Yeah, I mean, uh, right now, I, you know, I, I think that there's there's a lot of factors. The supply chain issue being one of them. It's hard to get even gas cars right now. Uh, but I think that yeah, in terms of the way that uh, dealerships operate, um, in some cases you need really more workforce training in terms of um, you know what can you do to uh, you know sell these EVs. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, yeah, the supply problem is, uh, <laughs> it's a whole sort of <laughs> kettle of fish. Um, but, you know, I, I think that one thing that you can observe is that in provinces where they have policies, government regulation, that says that you need to meet a legal obligation as an auto manufacturer, um, in terms of bringing X number of electric vehicles into the province, where they have those policies, uh, British Columbia and Quebec, uh, you see much higher uptake of EVs because the EVs are available. Um, so the, the supply issue is, yeah, it, it's immensely complex. It's not that I'm not um, sympathetic to, to supply chain issues uh, and, and to issues with, you know, dealerships specifically and, and can we do a certain amount of workforce training um, can we have more places where EVs can be serviced? Um, that's another problem. You know, all of these are barriers, but at the end of the day, uh, I think it's really the government regulation piece that, um, that ensures a higher supply. Uh, and the problem is, you know, and this is getting into the weed, um, but uh, once we start to get these federal government policies that say, you know, X amount of EVs have to be sold in Canada, the provincial policies like they have in, in Quebec and, and BC will start to kick in. So ideally we need something that says that each province is gonna get 
a certain amount of electric vehicle supply according to the population in that province. Um, and once we have that level of government regulation, I, I think that um, I think that honestly, it's it's the biggest problem. Um, and you will start you will start to see those other problems uh, addressed and, and figured out a little bit more. Yeah, and I think I think the nice piece about that is that you know everyone's in the same boat. I think it makes it easier. So you know, and and if you do it organically, if you do it, you know, at the same on the same side of the table as the industry, you know, I think that that goes a long way as well. So if you don't sit down, sit on the same side, and say, listen, what are your concerns and what do, what are you know what what what, what would be the concern for doing this? You know, would this be an outlay? Would it be a risk? What does that look like? Um, and, and so you understand their concerns and then and then do it organically. So you bring them gradually rather than a big step change and operation change for them, because that's hard to manage. Um, then you're probably going to get a lot more buy-in from them. And so this, I really feel like there's ways, there's always ways to do that where we can where we can sort of you know come together a bit closer and figure out, you know what our strengths are and what our concerns are and where the overlap is and we can achieve so much more when we when we you know when we understand you know how we can help each other. Um, so I, I, I like that piece. I think that's really good. I think it could be delivered in a way that that won't be objectionable to um, to the to the industry, the, the oil supply industry. You know, so if it's done in a way that takes into account you know um, the challenges that they face, then they would probably be proponents of it often you can achieve that so i think that's fantastic yeah no I, I absolutely i think that's right that there's a there's a way to sort of understand definitely their concerns because at this moment in particular there's there's supply chain concerns that are you know we can understand outside of the control of, of specific companies um so that's a that's a huge factor too and I, I, yeah i think the communication piece is, is important as well um but yeah you know at least we can agree that uh, that these are problems that we need to address. You know, that supply issue, that charging issue, uh, and that these are things that we need to get on now, because uh, you don't want to be running in these problems in uh, you know in 2028 uh, or 2030. Um, yeah. I have I have one more question. Seeing as there's there's no other questions, um, in terms of and you you touched on this a little bit strategies and like what what we at the ecology action center can do on the front of helping let builders developers know that this is something they really should could be considering like i'm assuming you're doing that but how can we be involved because i know you know thomas has his campaign and the he's been focusing a lot on electric school buses and evs generally then we also have on our efficiency side, looking at buildings, and I hadn't really considered how this is a place where these two things are coming together um, so importantly, and just curious some ideas of how we can educate builders, developers, property owners on this, or what, um, what you've been doing, George, on that front. Um, yeah, no, I think the capacity piece I see that a lot. I see that in agriculture. I see it in fisheries. Um, the capacity piece. I see that in industrial energy management. You know, there's a lot of a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of energy that's used inefficiently, and there's a lot of expertise that's needed, but it's just not in. But it's not in sufficient supply, and and so and it, you know you can't just turn the tap on. You know, and and it's there. It takes you've got to to experience and knowledge that that um, that is able to do this kind of work because it's complex work, um, and that that it's 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 very similar in respect to this kind of work. You know, um, there's a lot of from an electrical inst installation and and uh, contracting piece. It's, it's a lot of stuff that's very similar, right? You know, you're sizing a submain, you're putting in a submain, you're doing a you know whatever you paperwork with NSPI and um, you know inspections and the likes. But it, you know, you've also got a load and, and you know you load on the end of the cable and but then the way that that's used and the way and there's other considerations and other things and it's, it's a training piece but not everyone knows how to do it and you can accelerate that and if you know um and it might be down to you know how do you do it in moves and how what, what's the fastest and most effective way and what are some tips and tricks so that you don't have to do things twice or re-drill that hole in the concrete wall or you know um, that kind of learning can be taught and trained i think partnership with Nova Scotia, um, NECC with, um, you know, the trade schools, 
um, and with consultants as well. I think, you know, grads um, out of universities, especially like Dalhousie Engineering, um, I think there should, should be a partnership. There should be more partnership. I think there's, a, there's really, there's a lot of room to look at win, 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 win situations where we need, the province needs um, know-how, knowledge and experience capacity. So there's a win. Um, Nova Scotia Power wants to sell electrons. So there's a win. <laughs> you know? um, and, you know, the economy needs people operating it, you know, like um, economic activity. So that's a win. And then young people coming out of, of um, you know, out of their studies, you know, they're looking for a really good experience, the best possible experience they can get. Well, well that's really great cutting edge experience. It's definitely future focused and it's definitely going to be a future source of activity for them and, you know, moving forward for a long time to come. And it's really good experience. And so you can take, you can take the experience that we do have in the market and we can supervise these young people learning how to do that stuff and driving the next economic shift forward. I think a lot of partnership, um, there's a lot of capacity to, to take advantage of that partnership and get a lot of go for it. And, and, you know, that's not relying so much on bringing people into the province, but it's, it's maybe you do that, maybe you do both of that. You bring people in, but you also have a strategy to really uh, drive the uptake of capacity in, in, in your own people. I think um, I really, I'm a firm believer in that. I've seen it work really well, and I feel like there's a lot of capacity to maximize that. that that's, that's where I would start with that kind of thing. Thank you so much. Um, Thomas, or do either of you have any final, final thoughts, final words? I would just like echo what, okay. I, I was just going to say, I, I would just echo what George said about specifically about, you know, workforce development. Uh, there was a time in, in Canada when we were, you know, uh, electrifying homes in this country, uh, and it required a, you know, a massive investment in the workforce here. Um, you know, and in the case of people like my grandfather, he got money to, you know, go to school and become an electrician uh, and do this work. Uh, so I think that that's, you know, we could be viewing the electrification of transportation in, in a similar vein, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we need in order to really grow our workforce in a big way in, and recognizing that this is going to be, you know, a big shift um, in terms of, you know, the level of infrastructure that's going to be required. Um, so, uh, yeah, all that, all that to say, uh, it, it'll require some investment, I think, but uh, enormous opportunities here. Yeah. Thank you. I love the thing you said, George, about future focused, right? And there's a lot of work to be done um, if we're going to meet, and we have to meet <laughs> our 2030 targets. Um, so I think just getting everybody focused on thinking about all the work that needs to happen and this being an important piece of that, that I, you know, I don't think it's been on everyone's radar. And so thank you so much for for drawing attention to it and talking about it. And it'll be up for, for people to watch and we'll definitely send our members um, to view the presentation. So appreciate you taking the time, appreciate you coming out tonight, Thomas, and um, shout out to Claire, who's been doing all of the background tech. Um, we'll have another Better Building series next month and uh, hope that you'll all be back and join us. Have a great night, everybody.